I worked on sections uh, 4.8 and 4.9 of Anton. Uh, the next video will complete chapter 4. I think I'm sure of that. I've been looking through and there are some transformations in here that are going to be... I'm probably going to skip the latter problems probably in 4.11 just as I did in 4.10. It got into applications and I just... I did enough for what I wanted. So 4.8, 4.9. Then, oh yeah, I read 4.9. And uh, this video will be going out on August 7th. I'm filming it a week and a half before, something like that. So, yeah, that's that. So, I'll show the book. And I was expecting uh, 4.9 to be considerably harder than it turned out to be. Um, 4.8 turned out to be uh, the meat of the work uh, for this particular update. And it's all, it's all about rank and nullity. And you have this equation where the rank of the matrix plus the nullity is equal to the number of columns. And uh, if you look at one example, for example, in this matrix, those two zero rows are the nullity. And those two rows uh, that have leading ones are the rank. That's basically it. Uh, and then, of course, you also have that the rank of the matrix is the number, of course, I just said that, the number of leading variables and the nullity is the number of parameters in the general solution. So, of course, you look in here and the nullity is not two. I said the wrong thing. It's really uh, four right here. So, you're going to need four parameters to get these. Am I correct? None, the nullity. No, it's, yeah, it's three actually, three parameters. You have, you need S, T, and U. Yeah. Then some uh, geometric interpretations. Then having to do, the, also some relations for the transpose of the matrix. So, of course, for the transpose of the matrix, you're going to be looking at the number of rows uh, for comparing the dimensions. And so there's all these dimension equations. And then there's all these equivalent statements that add to theorem 238. There it is. So 238, way back when, said uh, a bunch of equivalent statements about a square matrix. It's invertible, has a trivial solution for the, the uh, homogeneous case, uh, and other uh, features of the matrix, including, of course, the determinant of the matrix is not equal to zero. We've seen this before. And then you stop right here, and then you add a bunch of other stuff having to do with column vectors, row vectors, uh, rank, and nullity, and then orthogonal complements, which is towards the end here. Yeah, right here. Right here. So orthogonal complements. Uh, so you can just, when you complement them, you get the uh, zero vector. And there's a really neat example, which uh, I use uh, multiple times. In the problems, which goes back to section 3.4, there's an example in section 3.4 right here, where uh, you show uh, effectively you're showing an example of uh, an orthogonal complement right here because you take the row vectors of the matrix, and when you dot them with your solution, the vector form, you're going to always get zero. So all these get zero when you multiply by these parameter equations by the one parameter equation you came up with when you solved the matrix. Yeah, that, that, there's a lot of meat in this particular section. And then when it comes to the transformations, this uh, turned out to be very easy for me based, of course, on engineering work that I did many years ago, but I think it's also generically uh, simple. It's straightforward. Once you lay out where how you're projecting, um, what, what you're reflecting, then uh, you're projecting uh, right here where you're zeroing out one dimension and then you are rotating so you have to use an angle counterclockwise is a positive angle clockwise is a negative angle and then you know right hand rule then you have your rotations in three dimensions and then your shear where you're really using something from the other dimension to squeeze one, the, you're, you're using one dimension to squeeze the other, and that's why you get these uh, shears. Where, where are the shears? The shears are right here. I'm sorry. They're right here. 
I went too fast. And then, of course, there's also uh, dilations and contractions. So you make it bigger or smaller towards zero. And then when you work all that out, it gets fairly repetitive. I did not look at this closely, of course, because I hadn't done it. And I thought this section was going to take me forever. But in reality, the problems are very, very formulaic. All right, so on to uh, the actual work itself. Not as much as a typical week, uh, but I don't want to have three more videos uh, to complete chapter four. I want to have two and then move on. Chapter four has just become a, an odyssey. So here's the reading for section 4.8. As I showed, I like to divide what each group of the equivalent statements are. These are the ones that come from theorem 2.38. These are the ones that have to do with row and column vectors, and then rank and nullity and uh, orthogonal complements. Yeah. Then I started working on the problems. I got a little confused, and then slowly got myself unconfused. But then it was pretty much smooth sailing uh, for this section, the latter problems. And I was actually surprisingly close in one of my uh, proofs. Yeah. Yeah. And this little, this is a very neat trick. So how do you find the matrix for where the rank of A is equal to the rank of B, but the rank of A square is not equal to the rank of B square? fiddle around, I couldn't see why, but then I stumbled on when, uh, when the leading one is offset by at least one column and you square the matrix, everything lands on the first row. So this matrix starts as a rank two matrix. When you square it, it ends up as a rank one. So you just pick two examples and you sure is, you sure are gonna get rank of A square is not equal to rank of B square. Then I came up with yet another example. Sure enough, that was neat. Uh, yeah. Then the method of using the transpose uh, to find the column vectors. Yeah, and then doing the congruence that, that I was showing in that example in section 3.4, but now doing it with the transpose. And I got it right. It took me a while. There's actually some scratch paper in here that I did not add to this notebook uh, because I screwed it up. I screwed this up but then I got it right. Yeah, and there was a final uh, problem where I got close, but I was like, you know, I'm gonna move on. I get the gist of what I'm supposed to do, and it's not, it's not that important for me to get this particular problem. Sometimes there's divide and conquer for making progress. True and false, as usual, I screwed up a couple, wrote down why I screwed them up, and then once I get down to section 4.9, it's just very much crank them out. Just crank them out. They, they follow very specific matrices. One thing that I like to do, and I don't know if you like this to do it this way, but when I have a bunch of problems that have angles and they're within a certain range, I knew all the angles here were between pi over 2 and minus pi over 2. I just make myself a table. I'm not going to calculate each one by, by one or even look them up one by one. Just do my little lookup table and then just crank them all out uh, just by referencing that table. I did forget this was a minus four instead of a four when I checked the answer. But yeah, you, you have your basic matrices and you know which ones are shears, which ones are dilations, which ones are rotations or projections and just crank them all out. And that was sections 4.8 and 4.9.